Okay. Well, hello and welcome back to the GreenGov Sustainability Week. We hope that you've enjoyed and learned from this week's webinars. Today's webinar is on partnering to create climate resilient communities. We have with us Pennsylvania DEP Secretary Zadeh, as well as staff from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources here with us to lead through this important topic today. As with all the sessions this week, today's session will be recorded and later posted on our GreenGov website. We also have Spanish translation available and you can get to the translation services through the controls at the bottom of your screen. The goal is to have about 30 to 40 minutes of presentation followed by about 10 to 15 minutes of question and answer session. So please do type your questions in the chat and as you think about questions through the presentation. Let's make this as interactive as possible. And thanks again for joining. I'd like to recognize um, our friend and colleague, Peter Boger from the Penn State Sustainability Institute. Uh, Peter is an assistant director for community engagement at Penn State Sustainability Institute. And Peter has been very instrumental in helping us shape our GreenGov and Sustainability Institute mm -hmm. partnership uh, where we are currently collaborating on our fourth webinar series and the new sustainability series between our collaboration starts actually next week on next Friday, October 14th and runs through the spring of 2023. Um, we have sessions on the first session next week is decent work and economic growth. That's next Friday, the 14th. And we have a household carbon reduction building sciences connection in November. Um, we have a food systems webinar for sustainable and resilient community food systems in January. And then we have two back-to-back -back water webinars in February and March, followed by a land management best practices for ecosystem services and health and pollinators in April, ending in April. So we can post that. Um, how you can sign up for those webinars um, in the chat here in a few minutes and we hope that you join us for those those uh, webinars over the course of this uh, fall and winter into the spring but let's get started on partnering to create climate resilient communities uh, the session highlights sustainable development goal number 17 on the importance of creating and maintaining partnerships particularly for this session is to create partnerships that achieve environmental progress that's the focus of this session. So we have with us, um, starting us off for opening remarks, we are pleased to introduce Ramez Zadeh, Acting Secretary of the Pennsylvania Depart Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, really? Ramez served as Executive Deputy Secretary of Programs at the Department of Environmental Protection since June 2017 and previously served as Director of Bureau of Waterways Engineering and Wetlands. Hermes is a licensed professional engineer in the states of Pennsylvania and California. He received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Pittsburgh in 1993. And Hermes started his career at DEP in 1994. He has over 28 years of extensive experience in environmental permitting, compliance, policy and regulatory rulemaking. And we just wanted to welcome Secretary, and I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, welcome to the fourth day of the Pennsylvania Sustainability Summit hosted by the Pennsylvania Green Government Council. Um, again, my name is Ramiz Ziade. I'm the Acting Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, and one of the three co-chairs of the Green Gov Council. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, the Green Gov Council Director and Assistant Director, Mark Hand and Matt Reese. Um, um, as well as the uh, Summit Coordination Committee for delivering a successful and informative event. Um, and I am pleased to be introducing today's session uh, in, uh, entitled Partnering to Create Climate Resilient Communities. Uh, today's session, as well as the preceding lunchtime sessions, have focused on a sustainable future and addressing the climate crisis today. Um, working together uh, and building lasting partnerships that can leverage skills and resources will be 
clearly uh, paramount to protecting our communities. Uh, as you guys may be aware, uh, DEP has produced several reports, including the Climate Impacts Assessment Report and the Climate Action Plan uh, that detail the threats and opportunities that changing climate will bring as well as ways to mitigate climate change by reducing our overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Pennsylvania's Climate Action Plan is made up of 18 strategies that can lower emissions and meet our goals of a 26% reduction in greenhouse gas pollution by 2025 and 80% a reduction by 2050 from baseline levels. Uh, the most recent climate impacts assessment report predicts more frequent instances of extreme rainfall events, leading to an average of 8% increase in rain causing statewide inland flooding events. Um, these flooding events will increase impacts to our infrastructure, buildings, roads, power lines, pipes, and property. Um, and that's why communities must partner together with solution providers and state, federal, and local partners to address ways to incorporate green infrastructure. Examples could be things like adaptive design and flood, flood management practices to control or abate the impacts of stormwater and also critical upgrades to wastewater, drinking water, and private sewer systems in the face of these extreme uh, rainfall events. Our partners at the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources have several great examples of natural solutions, specifically green stormwater infrastructure solutions that you can learn about and then implement in your neighborhood where appropriate. Uh, programs like Tree Vitalize and Watershed Forestry Projects have been designed into their parks to allow for the natural environment to help control the impacts of stormwater and uh, play a key role in those areas becoming more sustainable. Uh, during today's program, uh, you will hear from DCNR's professionals about not only solutions, but ways to fund these solutions. Uh, thank you, and let us begin this afternoon's program to help us share information, leverage partnerships, and support continued efforts to achieve sustainability in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary, for the for the remarks from coming from DEP's perspective. I much appreciated in joining us today. Um, we're going to now turn it over to our DCNR pr presenters, and I want to introduce. Uh, both at the same time, and then we'll turn the, the uh, presentation over to them to go from there. So first we have, uh, uh, I'm going to do it in reverse order, we'll have Lori Yike, has a master's in recreation and parks from Pennsylvania State University and a bachelor's in biology from Juniata College. So she's a fellow alum with me. In 1999, she began working for, for DCNR's Bureau of Recreation and Conservation. She currently manages the central regional offices of DCNR's Bureau of Recreation and Conservation and has over 25 years of professional experience working with government entities and nonprofit organizations to preserve and enhance public recreation and conservation amenities in communities and regional landscapes throughout central Pennsylvania. And now Ned Brockmeyer is currently the Tree Vitalize Program Manager for Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry at DCNR. Ned has an ISA certified arborist since 2015, has a master's of landscape architecture, and has spent much of his career in youth development. He spent many years managing nonprofit urban farms and youth employees in both Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Indianapolis, Indiana, where, which include large fruit and nut orchards. Nat also worked for Keep Indianapolis Beautiful, another nonprofit in Indianapolis as a community arborist and youth tree team manager where he helps to plan and plant trees and communities throughout the city while educating employees in youth and urban forestry. 
So welcome to you both. And I'll now turn the presentation over to Lori. Thanks for joining us today. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you, uh, Net, uh, Mark and Matt for allowing uh, DCNR to participate in this fabulous session. And also want to recognize Mike Walsh, our Deputy Secretary at DCNR. We are very excited to present today about how DCNR is working with communities to create places that are climate resilient through our technical assistance and grant program. Today's agenda, we are so excited to speak to you today. Both Ned and I will speak throughout the presentation. And as uh, described earlier, please hold your questions to the end and put them in the chat. Mark will be monitoring them and we will address them at the end. Uh, we plan to first give us a couple information about how our work supports the 2030 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, talk about impact of climate change on communities, describe green stormwater infrastructure, get into some case studies so you see how this really works in the real world, discuss some funding sources, then we'll summarize and have questions and answers. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so DCNR, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources is a leader in addressing impacts of climate change and facilitating partnerships to improve community resiliency. How do we do this? We are managing and protecting 124. It was 121 two weeks ago, but we just added three new state parks. Thank you, Governor Wolf. And we also managed 2.2 million acres of forest land. We strive to provide equitable access and experiences to enjoy 85,000 miles of waterways, 12,000 miles of trails and 76 natural lakes. And we build sustainable communities and thriving outdoor recreation-based economies through our robust grant program and technical assistance and outreach. We also promote and build sustainable infrastructure in our state parks and forestry buildings. We have 16 LEED certified buildings and countings and are striving to, in the process to convert our fleet vehicles to electric and hybrid. We also contribute to the economic health of Pennsylvania. Our state parks contribute 1 million billion annually and support almost 13,000 jobs. A local park and trails contribute 1.6 billion annually and support 12,500 jobs. And outdoor recreation spending in Pennsylvania results in 29 million annually and supports 251,000 jobs. So we're in there and we're very proud of all of our work. Next slide. So in, so, when we think about the 2030 goals of sustainable development, I actually came up with two. Uh, so the first one, 11, is make cities, human settlements, inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And when we talk about promoting and educating and incorporating green infrastructure and naturalized infrastructure into our public recreation amenities and public infrastructure, we're doing that. We're also as originally thought, strengthening our means of implementation and revitalization of global partnerships through, in, through integrated partnerships and strategic planning. So we're really addressing two of these goals. Next slide. So as which mentioned earlier, and I did uh, obtain this from Pennsylvania's action plan from DEP. And so when we think about what's happening in Pennsylvania, how is this in, how is climate change impacting us? And uh, can you click, we have, uh, it's impacting us mainly in two ways, through heat and through water. So many of us have seen the increased heavy participation inland and flooding. And what I have personally witnessed in my half a century or so, a time on this earth is how this really has impacted where I live. And there are things that I've seen and experiences I have had as a child with lots of snow and making snow forts that we just don't do anymore. And we are seeing rain events, not as a result necessarily of hurricanes, but just of microbursts. And we have witnessed that in recent years. And that is really impacting us. And the, and the impacts of heat waves and increasing temperatures and and the temperature at night just does not go down as it used to. And there are lots and lots of impacts on our community infrastructure, on our health, 
on equity and, and accessibility for people in our communities that this is really affecting. Next slide. So it's getting hotter and it's getting wetter. Okay, go ahead, next slide. So compounding the impacts of climate change are things that communities and a, a community officials are facing. They have aging infrastructure. They are trying to manage a, a and infrastructure in their community based on older models that were pre prevalent and useful 50 years ago, 25 years ago, when there wasn't as much rain and there wasn't as much heat. So, and there wasn't as much impervious surfaces due to conversion of farmland and woodlands and waterways to houses, warehouses, roads, bridges, and parking lots. So it's compounding the fact of we have these changes in climate and we have old infrastructure makes it very challenging at times for municipalities to adapt. Next slide. So communities have a choice to make. They can continue to managing their infrastructure they have been for years and spend exorbitant amounts of tax money to rebuild their infrastructure, pay higher insurance rates, negatively impact the health of their most vulnerable citizens, deter economic growth, and have minimal opportunities for outdoor recreation use, et cetera, or they can adapt, plan, and become resilient. The choice is up to local decision makers. DCNR and partnerships with many other agencies and nonprofit organizations will continue to support those that want to join us in making this change to becoming more resilient. Next slide. So, Let's talk about what is green infrastructure and what is gray infrastructure. EPA defines green infrastructure as a cost-effective, res resilient approach to managing wet weather and the impacts that provide many community benefits. It utilizes natural systems, guess what? Mother nature knows best, to manage flooding, improve water quality, and enhance ecosystems for humans, plants, and animals. In a nutshell, green infrastructure strives to slowly absorb water storm water on site, flooding water on site, hold it until it's cleaned up by plants and microorganisms, flows the velocity of water by dechannelizing, et cetera. It essentially cleans the water before it gets into a waterway so it doesn't pollute them as much. While single purpose gray infrastructure, conventional pipe drainage and water treatment systems are designed to move storm water from, away from the built environment and into our waterways. Therefore, it has no time to clean up and all that, all that pollution gets into our water and drinking sources. Green infrastructure reduces and treats stormwater at its source while delivering environmental, social, and economic benefits. Next slide. So I love this slide and I fully admit that I pirated from Land Studies uh, consultant firm. So when we think of a single function, okay, we think of the phone. Now, many of you probably didn't have this kind of phone. Um, but us older ones remember them. It, it's the one purpose. You're calling your friend or it's, you're calling your mom, hopefully. The slides are not synced with what you, there we go. That's better. Okay, okay. sorry. Um, when we think of green infrastructure, it has multiple benefits and multiple functions. So when you think of a single function, you have a one, an old phone, the dial up rate phone. Many of us uh, remember that, some of us don't, the newer ones, uh, but when you use that phone, you are doing a single purpose to call somebody. Just like in the picture below, there is a channel that's taking water away from a parking lot into and channeling, piping it somewhere into a waterway. No chance to clean it up. No chance to slow the velocity. When you think of multiple functions, we think of our cell phones Right, and how can we live without them? They have multiple functions, just like green infrastructure. So when you look at this picture, this is a wetland. That wetland has many functions. It serves to improve habitat, promote diversity in species. It holds water and prevents flooding. It's very good for pollinators. It provides opportunities for bird watching, for mental health improvements, exploration of ecological systems, environmental education, it absorbs heat. It diminishes the impact of heat and, and water effects on our environment. 
Next slide, please. So green infrastructure creates climate resilient communities. It does this by reducing flooding, drought, and urban heat. My friend Ned is going to talk more about how trees as, as, as a type of green infrastructure, decrease flooding, reduce temperatures, many other benefits he will focus on. When you think about rain gardens and bioswales, they slow flooding, they improve pollinator ha habitat, and they also reduce energy costs and improve health of our most vulnerable communities. Next slide. So here are some common types of green infrastructure found in community parks. However, they can also be utilized in private property as well. So on the, the top left, we have a rain garden. In the middle slide, we have a, a pervious parking lot with tree trenches that collect water and slow it down. We have a basketball court on the left with impervious surface. And basketball courts, when you, when you have that, um, the water drains through slowly and it gives people more opportunities to play basketball without flooding and it also reduces noise. And then on the right, we can have a, a no mowing zone where we converted turf to meadow and Ned will talk about that soon. Next slide. In this slide, we have a vegetated roof. On the far right, we have warm season grasses. We have runoff and capture reuse in the cistern and we, that some of these items are used in our state parks, such as the Nature Inn. On the top picture, we have Wrightsville's Riverfront Park that received growing greener money from DEP to address their stormwater regulations and flooding, which was leveraged with DCNR's grant program to create a pathway system, a playground pavilion, restroom, et cetera. More information about this community and others can be found in the October issue of an article in the October issue of the Pennsylvania State Association of Boroughs Magazine. And the, on the left, we see, a, we see floodplain restoration, vegetated swale. So these are examples of how to integrate funding from different sources. Okay, so Growing Greener can pay for those, NIF, uh, National, NIF WIF can pay for them, PennVest, and then we leverage that to put in the recreation amenities. I'll get into more detail about that later. So right now, we're gonna talk about, next slide please, some case studies of public parks and trails. Next slide. Um, so when we think about this, I wanna talk about making lemonade out of lemons. So what I hear in my tenure of working with municipalities when the new stormwater management goals came out to reduce phosphorus, nitrogen, and sediment, they were, they were saying, oh my goodness, how the heck are we gonna pay for this? What are we going to do? How is this going to work? However, I see we can make that and we can make it into lemon, lemonade. There's lemons, but there's lemonade. There's regulations, but there's opportunities for holistic involvement of many partners and partnerships to create a fantastic infrastructure within your community and have lots of sources of funding to do that. So we have stormwater mandates and hotter temperatures that's happening and flooding. But if we do an integrated planning approach, we can look at multiple sources, multiple funding sources and multiple community benefits. And that's what I'm gonna highlight next in these, study, in these case examples. Next slide. So when we think about resiliency planning and holistic planning, or integrated planning, there's all sorts of names for it. Um, we think of, I wanna give the example of the city of Harrisburg. So in 2018, the city of Harrisburg in partnership with Capital Region Water, they're the entity that manages their sewer and water system, developed a community greening plan with extensive public input. And what it did is it looked at their built infrastructure, it looked at their park systems, it looked at where they were having combined sewer overflows and flooding issues within the city. And it, just, it determined the best places to mitigate that. And the cost of the study was approximately 150,000, 75,000 of the DCNR paid and 75,000 came, came from uh, Capital Region Water. Next slide. So this, is, this image and this is taken from the study and what it shows here is that there are opportunities to mitigate climate change can be found throughout communities. 
parks, streets, alleys, homes, businesses, industry, schools. There is, an, an, there is impervious surface on all of these things and comprehensive plans look at the aspects of their community holistically. For Because we know that water doesn't stop running and it doesn't get, and the heat doesn't, it doesn't get cooler or instantly or hotter, it's hotter everywhere. And, and all infrastructure, public infrastructure, regardless of who owns it. However, green infrastructure can certainly mitigate some of that flooding and heat. Integrated natural infrastructure investments are an important step to funding and realizing opportunities and a cost effective efficiencies related to construction savings, such as dig once and opportunities to leverage grants targeted at different outcomes, whether it be reducing pollution mitigating flooding, improving a recreation access for all in order to achieve multiple benefits for the community. Other things that integrating resiliency planning, some, some plans are looking at, which we strongly encourage, is to partner with FEMA and Pima, who also can integrate their knowledge and their expertise on different flooding zones and flood related and emergency related planning. In fact, I was at a meeting in Sealands Grove several years ago where they were working with Penn State and they were looking at their zoning and they were thinking about, okay, this area is zoned commercial, but it keeps getting flooding, flooded. Should we rezone this to a natural area, to a community park, so that we don't have to keep investing and in cleaning this up if it's gonna to continue to flood? And that's where there's opportunities for partnership. Next slide. So in the city of Harrisburg, we, we partnered with them to rehab five existing parks, little playgrounds. And those were determined based on the data collected from the consultants in partnership with Capital Region Water, where Capital Region Water could address some of their combined sewer overflows and their pollution mandate reductions that they needed to do underneath the park structures and they incorporate green infrastructure and BMPs underneath the parks and leverage that money with DCNR to rehab the parks because the citizens and the and the people living adjacent to there aren't really caring about well they have to reduce pollution what they care about is having a safe and green and place where their kids can walk to to play. That's what's really important to them. And the beauty of this arrangement is Capital Region Water is maintaining the infrastructure underneath and helping the city maintain the structure on top as well. So it was a, it was a $2 million partnership among Capital Region Water and Impact Harrisburg and the Commonwealth to rehab these five playgrounds. And we did this in two years. Next slide. Just gonna give one example. This was at Fourth and Dolphin Park. It featured new landscaping, playground equipment, sidewalks, and stormwater management. And so underneath, it, so the stormwater management elements were the rain gardens, pervious basketball court, restored vegetation, um, which are underneath, and people don't necessarily see that, but it really impacted the, the Capital Region Water's ability to capture that stormwater and reduce their overflows. You're probably wondering, well, how much did this cost? And this shows the partnerships that we're talking about as one of these goals. We are able to leverage funding when you look at parks holistically. And so DCED contributed 175,000, DCNR, uh, we did fund them, so 700,000, Capital Region Water, 250,000, and 200,000 in the green infrastructure in the park. So you can see that by incorporating a holistic view of how public infrastructure functions in a community, there's multiple benefits and multiple resources. Next slide. Next, we're gonna talk about Jackson Township. This is in York County, Pennsylvania, and we're gonna talk about their Little Creek Community Park. Now, what I wanna emphasize here is that Often communities have a park and they have a, a waterway that goes through it. And you think, well, my goodness, this waterway is a pain in the butt. It always floods. And what do we do with it? And however, if we think of it holistically, we can figure out a way to meet Jackson Township stormwater management goals that is, was incorporated into their, into their pollution reduction plan in this park. And they were able to get credit 
for how they were able to mitigate some of their pollution and stormwater runoff at the same time, then leverage funding that they receive from DEP to improve their park facilities. So little, this park is 41 acres and it was completed in 2012. So when you take look at a picture here, this is before what the creek looked like. You can tell that it is has a lot, lot of runoff. The, and the, it, people, it's being maintained by mowing all the way up to the buffer. And there's little recreation or conservation benefit and it floods often. Now we look at after. So we incorporated some green practices, we de-channelized it and we can see how it's functioned ecologically as it did before. Here are some of the amenities that we put into the park by leveraging DEP's funding that paid for that stream mitigation. So we did a playground. We can see there's a bioswale right in front of the pavilion and here's the bridge that we also paid for. Next slide. So how is this funded? We have many partners. So DEP, you can see that they did design and engineering at 53,000. Jackson Township put up 200. Um, there's various local sources. The York County Stormwater Consortium is another really great partner. Each county has consortium, some, some counties have consortiums. And if we can leverage some of that funding with ours, that's an eligible, um, that's an eligible match. So there we funded $450,000 in that part. The next study, we're gonna talk, next slide, please. The next and final case study I'm gonna talk about is Hanover Trolley Trail. I'm gonna speed up here so my colleague Joe has, uh, sorry, Ned has the opportunity to speak. Um, we're gonna talk about Hanover Trolley Trail. This is again in York County. Now the unique thing about Hanover Trolley Trail or the challenging thing is that it meanders along Oil Creek. However, look at this. Oh my goodness. So you can see the deep ravines of Oil Creek um, and how it is affecting how we're going to build that rail trail. We have to address the stormwater and remediate the stream banks before we can build the trail. So what they first did was they did a, a, an Oil Creek watershed restoration plan uh, funded by DEP. And it was a regional approach to improve water quality and community resilience by looking at how to de-channelize and improve this stream corridor. At the same time, we also did a master plan for the rail trail that incorporated the recommendations of the watershed plan. Because you have to fix the, the stream bank before you can build the trail and the two are so interrelated. It's again, it's a holistic look at your community as a structure. So with this slide, we're looking at there are, there are concept plans A and B, where you need to build the trail up and where you need to mitigate, make the stream de-channelize, how we do that. That's how they, they looked at. So typical section design consideration where water channel channeled away from the trail or you build the trail up based on where the stream is going. All right. So in summary, we can see that in these cases, DCNR's grant program was able to leverage funding with other sources of other state agencies and other organizations. Ned, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I'm gonna dive right in here. We're gonna do some case studies that look at the work that uh, we do in the rural and community forestry section at the Bureau of Forestry. And uh, hopefully, of course, now I can't go forward. Oh, there we go. Um, so I am the Tree Vitalized Program Manager, so I'm gonna start with that program today. It is the Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is a technical, financial, and educational assistance programming, uh, program delivering nature-based solutions to ensure a resilient and equitable tree canopy where more than 84% of Americans live. And I'll just make the point that while we do focus a lot of our urban and community forestry work in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, because we have most of our population in Pennsylvania living in those two metropolitan areas, we do urban plantings in smaller towns throughout the state as well. And I'll introduce you to some of the partners that do that work throughout my presentation. Um, so partnerships are essential to the work that we do in the RCF section, rural and community forestry. 
and Tree Vitalize is just actually has the smallest partnerships of the three programs we'll talk about. There are about 50 partners statewide. I'm just listing a few of them here. Uh, city of Pittsburgh, City of Philadelphia, and then major players, Pennsylvania Horticultural Society in Philly, Western PA Conservancy, and Tree Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. And then throughout Pennsylvania, I mentioned somebody who does work throughout the rest of the state, Tree Pennsylvania here. They are, a not, they are the Urban and Urban and Community Forestry Council for the state, but they're also a nonprofit that provide bare root tree grants uh, for places outside of Pittsburgh and Philly. Um, moving. So I wanted to give an example of the tree vitalized work in action. And I chose one near and dear to my heart because I actually got to be a part of this planting this spring. I am based out of Pittsburgh as well. So we're looking at the Oakland neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And for those of you unfamiliar, just to the south there is the Monongahela River. Uh, but you'll notice a severe lack of trees and green areas within this part of the city. And this is because uh, Oakland is, is a student section of Pittsburgh. It's where the University of Pittsburgh is. So there's tons of buildings. There's also a lot of healthcare facilities there, hospitals, and stuff like that. Um, and I want to make the point that sometimes it just takes one person who wants to do some good work or two people in this case. We have uh, partners at the Oakland Planning and Development Corporation of Pittsburgh. It's a community development organization, nonprofit that is based in this uh, neighborhood. And um, they recognized that there were lots of trees missing. And so they actually reached out to Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, Friends at Tree Pittsburgh, the University of Pittsburgh Sustainability Office, uh, and actually many more partners to organize and run multiple tree plants. They did community engagement throughout COVID. Uh, that included a lot of um, letters being sent to homes and outreach via newsletters since they weren't able to go door to door as we usually do in this type of work. Um, but they managed to get uh, folks to opt in in certain areas and they utilized uh, public you know, street uh, availability as well. So the things that the city owns in addition to what the Oakland Planning and Development Corporation owns. Um, these are just a few pictures of the tree planting day from this past spring, actually, that I participated in. There was another one in 2020, and I'm just going to show a few more images of these as I go throughout. But I, I want to make the point that this wouldn't have been possible without the partnerships that we have. Um, they worked with Tree Pittsburgh to make sure that tree tenders courses were offered. Tree tenders are offered throughout the state. That's an educational way to learn how to to do community forestry because it really is uh, people-based. Um, so there are tree tenders who now maintain the trees. And I'll actually show you some of those photos here. Here was the 2020 planting. And then here on the upper left actually is the, the maintenance day. So um, these, this summer they were actually out there watering and mulching trees that got planted the past two years. Uh, it really does require um, Folks from the community, obviously, they're lucky in Oakland because they have access to Pitt Serves, the volunteer organization that the University of Pittsburgh runs, and there's hundreds of students who participate in that. So they, they do the maintenance themselves um, and, and with help and support from our partners at Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and Tree, Vital, uh, Tree Pittsburgh. So we're, we're lucky to be able to work with these folks in Pittsburgh. Um, 33 trees have already been planted in a densely populated low canopy area. Uh, where the benefits are great. And um, just so you see where those trees are sort of sprinkled throughout again. But I do wanna talk quickly about the benefits of urban trees. And I, I use this because it's just a great example from the Nature Conservancy, uh, who we work with all the time. You know, trees are often known for, for filtering out pollutants, but really knocking them down in an urban setting. Uh, the leaves help knock those small particulates to the ground, so you're not inhaling them. So it helps to lower asthma rates. Uh, the thing I really want to focus on and, and that I forgot to mention in the last few slides is that um, urban heat island, especially in like a neighborhood like Oakland and Pittsburgh, is a huge issue. Sometimes those neighborhoods, I know it says two to four degrees get reduced uh, when you have trees, but there are sections of Pittsburgh and Philly that end up 15 to 20 degrees warmer in the summer than other areas that are forested. So we really, with climate change uh, really forcing us to, to look hard at these situations, we need to add more trees than uh, low canopy areas in cities. Of course, reducing rates of cardiac disease, strokes, and asthma due to the improved air quality. We're protecting biodiversity with trees. It provides habitat for migrating birds, pollinators. Oak trees and cherry trees are, are particularly great at uh, providing habitat for our um, Lepidoptera in, in the cities, which form the basis of our, our food chain for birds and things. 
Uh, of course, it reduces obesity levels by increasing physical activity. It manages storm water and reduces urban flooding. A large uh, shade tree can take, I believe, up to 500 gallons of water in a storm. Um, so it really helps our combined sewage systems to handle the, the overflow during those events. Um, and of course, it increases neighborhood property values. And last but not least, I think my favorite is reducing stress. And I think we all know what, what getting into the woods can feel like. I know over the, the pandemic, I spent a lot of times uh, in my local woods near my house in, a, in an urban park here in Pittsburgh. And it, it helps, helps me still when I have a stressful day. Um, the other programs I wanna mention in rural and community forestry include riparian forest buffers, that's trees and shrubs planted uh, to create a forest within street, 300 feet of a stream or water body. Um, this is on ag lands or non-ag lands, so ag is agriculture for those who may be curious. Um, and then we also have lawn conversion. There are two practices and lawn conversion really does require a lawn. So it has to currently be maintained as grass that you mow. Um, and it has to be regularly mowed to six inches or less. Um, and then you can do one of these two practices, lawn to meadow or lawn to forest. And I'll talk a little bit about these. Um, the riparian forest buffers, I wanna talk about first, this is just a sample uh, planting um, that DCNR Bureau of Forestry partnered with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections uh, to conduct a training program for currently incarcerated individuals to get them interested in potential careers in the green industry during reentry. Um, throughout the summer of 2019, DCNR and the Alliance visited a group of inmates participating in Huntington Bay Correctional Institute's uh, community work program to provide weekly trainings about riparian forest buffer design, planting and maintenance. And the training series culminated in the fall with the planting of a two acre riparian forest buffer on SCI property that, that was farmed by a local crop farmer. Through uh, the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, they access funds that DCNR had been awarded by National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, NIFWF, which uh, Lori mentioned earlier, to plant the two acre forest buffer. Trees in this planting came from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Keystone 10 Million Trees program. The end results of the project include the improvements of the uh, Correctional Institute's property, the protection and buffering of a small stream that flows into a tributary of the Juniata River and eventually the Chesapeake Bay, as well as job training for about 20 inmates over the course of the program. These inmates will bring their new green infrastructure knowledge back to their communities when they are released. And the buffer will go on improving water quality in Huntington County, both on the SCI property and everywhere else downstream. In general, riparian forest buffers help to mitigate flood impacts, improve water quality, reduce the cost of water treatment necessary for drinking water sources, they increase wildlife habitat, improve air quality, and improve property values among just a few of the benefits we can name. I do want to talk as well about lawn conversion. Um, you know, when you're mowing your turf grasses, whether that's at home, it's, you know, or if you do it for work at a municipal park or a golf course or a school campus, churches, backyards, front yards, you could definitely have a meadow instead. And that is the point we want to make for our lawn conversion program. With an example of the meadow at Pleasant View, this is a senior living community in Lancaster County. This was previously two acres of mowed turf grass, and now you can see it is a flourishing meadow. Um, lawn conversion funding first became available in 2020, and this was one of the first projects that got funded through a partnership between DCNR and Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Um, prior to this, there were lots of prob problems with algae in the pond, and the trail around the pond was not used a lot. So I want to show these photos. In the upper left, this was May 17th of 2021. 17 days before this site was seeded. In the bottom middle, this was June 28th, 2021, 42 days after seeding. You can see a lot of the cover crop coming up. It looks, looks pretty unattractive. Residents were complaining at this point, but it's important in the first year to really stick with it. So on the right, you can see June 28th, 2022. This was 407 days after the first seeding and one year exactly from the bottom middle photo. You can see the black-eyed Susans have really taken off. It's diverse, it's beautiful, it's attracting birds and butterflies. This actually helped remove the algae issues in the water. Uh, the mowed paths around it create a nice walkway through this beautiful meadow and the residents are now loving it and it's a destination for them to walk. Um, so it's a really great program. The photos here are by Lance Study. 
do want to quickly mention the ability of our, um, our, our programs to remove pollutants. Um, MS4 PRP stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System Pollution Reduction Plans. That's a mouthful. Um, there are no sediment removal rates for the meadow because models assume that the ground cover is the same for that. The ground cover realistically isn't the same. Uh, the watershed forestry team is hoping to work with Penn State University to conduct research to see if meadows do remove sediments or have lower sedimentation rates compared to turf grass. So hopefully that'll be coming. The MS4 PRPs are based on sediment reductions. So the better sediment reduction of practice gets, the better it will form as an MS4 best management practice. But every little bit counts and it's worth adding that these BMPs best management practices to MS4 plans so all re reduction credits can be counted towards the reduction goals for an MS4 community. Really quickly want to mention that we do have a supplemental fall grant round open for our community and watershed forestry programs. Uh, it is open until October 27th. Uh, this usually doesn't happen. The minimum ask is $50,000. The max ask is $5 million and the match is 20%. There's a four year project span for these funds. And you can see just in the lower left there, the types of projects. So as I mentioned, tree vitalize, of course, but then riparian forest buffers and lawn conversion as well. Um, another website we wanna point out is this green stormwater infrastructure page on the DCNR website can help uh, you plan your own project in your community, gives you more knowledge about um, what green infrastructure is, how you can incorporate these um, elements into your own parks and help mitigate the impacts of climate. So when you get these slides, be sure to take a look. And all of this, uh, you know, all the work that we do within rural and community forestry is not um, really worth it for us unless everything comes with maintenance, to be perfectly honest. There's no point in putting these trees in the ground unless we have a plan for how they're going to be maintained over the long term. And so when we have grants, we do ask uh, our grantees to have a plan for maintenance. It's a critical component of the installation of these projects. Um, you know, scheduling the maintenance as soon as the project is installed is essential and engaging ecological landscapers and maintenance professionals is important. And of course, as I mentioned before, it, it is a lot of volunteers and in, in tree vitalized certainly, and I think a lot as well for our uh, lawn conversion and riparian forest buffers. So it takes folks like you who are listening today to volunteer for these projects and, and show up. Um, Wanted to include this slide, I'll be really quick here. This is just our contact information. So if you're interested in any of the different programs, tree vitalized, lawn conversion, or riparian forest buffers that we offer, feel free to reach out to myself, Kelsey or Teddy. Our emails are there, our phone numbers are there. Um, and it sounds like you'll probably get these slides at the end. So hopefully you'll be able to contact us that way. And then I'll just point out um, lastly, so fortunately in our riparian forest buffer program, we've been fortunate to add five new employees over the past two months. And we now have these regional watershed forestry specialists. They all touch a little bit of the Bay watershed. That's the hatching that you see through the middle of the, the state there, but you can see the contact names. Uh, if, if you see the name that's in your county or in your region, feel free to, to write down their, their uh, contact information and reach out to those folks and they can help you plan one of these projects for your community. Um, I will quickly just shamelessly plug, if you go to Western Pennsylvania Conservancy's job website, you'll find a job for Tree Vitalize. We are hiring a Chesapeake Bay community tree specialist specifically to work in the Bay watershed. A quick shameless plug. Lori, I'm gonna pass it back. <laughs> That's not shameless. Okay, so um, can we go to the next slide, please, with you have these in our contacts? Okay. So we, um, besides the, the tree vitalized and the lawn to meadow conversion and all sorts of exciting things like that, we also have a robust grant program for uh, traditional parks, trails, waterways, um, conservancies, all sorts of um, plethora of projects that you can apply for. Here's the contact information for regional advisors around the Commonwealth. Um, I didn't point out earlier, the, the, I manage the central region. So my team handles counties in the bright green here and the light blue, three and four. And then I directly handle the ones in the gray blue. Uh, next slide. I don't okay, know why so, these are gone from here. I don't no, see you have to keep clicking. So click, so I have them floating in. 
Yeah. So there's a variety of funding sources. Um, so there's Pennsylvania Department of Community Economic Development. All these sources can be used as match. Most of our grant programs, well, most of them today require 50% match. We're getting more and more to a 20% match in our con uh, conservation-based projects, but most of them require 50% and a 20% or a 20% match. DCNR, of course, we have a plethora of funding. Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, we've partnered with them on numerous trail projects. And, uh, and, and they have been very supportive in some of their programs with um, naturalized system and BMPs. Next slide, I mean, next click, next funding source. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so um, as you've heard, the American Rescue Fund has provided substantial resources to many of these departments. Now they're just getting organized, a lot of them, but please pay attention to their websites and their announcements because there's going to be in 2023, numerous opportunities for uh, funding, especially in EPA and Brownfields, there's substantial funding there. And that, that federal money can match our state money. Next, click it again, please. You can just keep clicking and I'll talk. Um, so Chesapeake Bay Trust, that's a new partner that I've discovered the last couple of years, fabulous organization. They're doing a lot of work with green infrastructure. And again, it's a funding partner with our program. Next slide, next, please. Just keep clicking, Ned. I think I'm past where you were, to be perfectly honest. Okay. The clicking keeps like backing up here. Sorry. All right, that's okay. So uh, wanna talk about there's, um, other funding sources that you've heard it, and we've received a lot of grant applications in the last year uh, using American Rescue funding. So ARPA funding is an eligible match towards ours, and we're seeing a lot of great use of that funding source. We also have a DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. You heard me talk about them earlier with my case studies, and they have a uh, growing greener and that money can be used towards ma our match as well. And National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, that was another strong source for these types of projects. And PennVest is a very big partner as well. The Amer can you go to the next slide, the American Rescue Plan? Okay, so the American Rescue Plan of 2021, as I mentioned earlier, is a fabulous source of funding that we're seeing in our grant program. Highly recommend that you talk to your municipality about how they're using their ARPA funds. It is eligible for these types of projects. Next slide. So in summary, you have stormwater management and permitting, climate change impacting communities, and we can do capital improvement projects based on integrated planning and green infrastructure. And there's multiple funding sources and community benefits. So with the impacts of climate change, communities have the opportunity to go as they are and continue to rebuild and pay lots of money insurance rates, have impacts on their community's health. You can go that route, or you can adapt and change and become resilient. Okay. And you become a climate resilient community. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we Lori, made this you made it. Um, that was an excellent presentation, Lori. And Ned, thanks for some of your examples are just um, amazing. The transformation of the green infrastructure projects is fantastic. And the resources, there's obviously many, many resources to go through. Um, we don't have time for question and answer. Um, and the session's kind of expired, but um, I I assume we can have folks reach out to uh, Lori and Ned through um, the, the links and maybe, I don't know if you want to, we can drop uh, that in the chat as well, how they, how folks want to reach you. But this was a great presentation and um, just wanted to um, encourage folks to join tomorrow. It's our last um, sustainability week presentation uh, from Correctional Industries. And we will have um, D, uh, DCNR Deputy Secretary John Norbeck joining uh, the corrections uh, staff to talk about 
second chance opportunities for inmates and how basically ways we're leverage, leveraging partnerships and making um, a difference uh, for inmates in training and education and reentry programs. So please do join us. It's very interesting. Um, and um, there's also the, um, for any of the folks from Penn State, your SMEAL College of Business students can scan the QR code and get credit for today's session. And um, with that, I guess we will end and uh, thank you. And we'll, hopefully you'll be joining us tomorrow. Appreciate everyone's time today. Mark.